Thank you for joining me today for a few moments in God's Word. I'd like for you to turn your attention to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 1 through 18. Let's read it together. 1 Kings, chapter 19, 1 through 18. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey in the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once, the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for your journey is too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death by the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. What a statement. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What? Are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I think that was stuck in his mind, don't you? The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus, when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Amron, and also anoint Jehu, son of Nishi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Zaphath, and Abel Malahola to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who will escape the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and all whose mouth has not kissed him. It'd be a wonderful thing if we could live in the moment of victory. What a great amount of miracles and demonstration of God's power had happened for Elijah when he prayed, and the whole nation had seen it. But my goodness, uh, it didn't seem to really impress anyone, but made most of them frustrated with God's prophet and God himself. Uh, people would rather have the status quo, even though it's not God and not the move of God and not godliness. Uh, they really don't want to be bothered and they don't want to deal with change. And uh, that sure hasn't, uh, it's no different today than what it has been historically. But it would be great to be able to just live in that moment of seeing God move, seeing a great move of God, demonstration of God's power, and be able to enjoy that. But we know that most often what happens is, is when God does something, 
the enemy comes to try to undo it or at least take away the value and the uh, feeling of wonder that we have when we are in the presence of God doing something extraordinary. Uh, seems as though the enemy does not want us to be able to enjoy that or fully embrace it. So he does something to distract us and try to steal away from us what God has done. Shouldn't be a surprise to you and I who know the Lord that uh, these kind of things are very discouraging. Uh, very often when you have been uh, used of God, you're spent physically and emotionally, even drained spiritually. Uh, it is an extraordinary thing for the power of God to come upon us in our human form. And very often it leaves us in our flesh and humanness. It leaves us spent and exhausted. And uh, we know that God has moved. We know the wonder of it and the excitement of it. But it, it really does drain us and leaves us spent emotionally very often. And we find Elijah hearing uh, the words that were very threatening from Jezebel. And he's on the run. Uh, he feels uh, spent and exhausted probably disillusioned when he sees that from his perspective that he's the only one left standing and here Jezebel, which has uh, uh, equal authority to the king himself, has uh, decreed that she's going to have him killed, hunted down and killed. Uh, this is very often what the enemy does to us as Christians. When we experience revival, uh, find the Lord as a personal savior, experience baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit, and God may do miracles and wonders in us and in our family, in our churches, in our communities. Uh, and when we go through that, the enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And uh, we feel immediately, tragically, very often we feel just uh, totally uh, caught off guard and the joy, the peace, the confidence, the miracle, the wonder is often just pushed aside because now we've got this new trial, this new circumstance that we're dealing with. And the moment of victory was just that, it seems very often. It, it does not seem to last. And a lot of that is because we are flesh. And uh, to embrace God, uh, if we fully embraced him, it could kill us humanly. And our flesh is carnal and weak. Uh, but to uh, go through a move of God, uh, go through a revival, very often you see people uh, back off. And it doesn't last seemingly very long. Just like Elijah, too often, uh, we as the people of God uh, do the same thing. Uh, especially when we feel like there's an attack. We feel... How can this happen when God has done something so extraordinary? How, how can we be under attack by the enemy? Uh, and we, we have disillusionment and we, we feel discouraged very often. And, and we wonder, uh, why should I keep uh, seeking God and experiencing what God has promised if all it's going to come is disaster and defeat? Uh, I hate to admit it, but many during times after we have seen a miracle, after God has used us and great things have happened, uh, many people of God uh, make bad choices. And the first one that Elijah made was he ran from the presence of the Lord. He ran from his servant that was there to help him. And he ran from the circumstance. Uh, at, at some point, uh, we need to realize that we shouldn't move unless God tells us to. Uh, even if it's fearful, even if it means death. Uh, the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, they didn't run. Uh, they faced the circumstance and stayed the course. Uh, but uh, we're not going to focus on the totality of the text uh, because we need to see through uh, this story to be able to find how and when God answers 
what do we do and what we should be looking for? Uh, uh, number one, I believe it's a mistake for Elijah to have ran. It was a fearful situation, and you may be in a fearful situation today. Maybe your strength is spent and your heart is broken, and there are a lot of things that are overwhelming to you today, and it feels as though the best thing for me is just to get out of here, uh, walk away from it, run from it. But I, I believe that very often that would be a mistake. We need to stand still and see what God's going to do. See the salvation of the Lord. Uh, it was a mistake for him to abandon and run from what God had just partnered with him to accomplish. Uh, we need to be careful not to step outside of not only God's will, but step outside of God's covering and his plan. Uh, our decisions so often are very rash and made in the moment instead of stopping and praying and waiting on God to reveal what is our next move. I, I've learned that God does not answer a prayer if we're not actually in his divine will. He can come to us, try to get our attention as he is with Elijah here in 1 Kings 19 and try to help Elijah understand what you're doing is not the best because he asked him twice, what are you doing, Elijah? And I think it's to help Elijah stop and evaluate what just happened. He's running out of emotional fear and exhaustion. And that's always a dangerous thing to do. Uh, like Elisha, I, I've learned that rest can make a big difference. And we see that the Lord provided food and water for him, that he could be nourished. And then he tells him, you need to go back to sleep and get some rest. Your strength is gone. And very often when we have been in a part of even a great revival, Physically, humanly, we are exhausted. And that's when the enemy knows we're very vulnerable and he can make us discouraged, defeated, depressed, uh, all kinds of confusion and what do we new, do now? And uh, then the enemy starts working and we feel, uh, you know, I, I can't keep doing this. It's more than my flesh can can stand and more than my mind can comprehend. And too often we do what Elijah did. He ran, stepped outside of God's covering and plan, uh, got away from the one person that was his companion that could encourage and affirm him to be careful and to take some time to rest and let God uh, uh, speak to him. But when God answers, if you look at verse 5 through 7, uh, in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings, you see that God answered number one by uh, uh, meeting Elijah's initial needs, and that was rest and food and water. Uh, God answered Elijah in a different way than most times we would like to be answered by God, and that is by asking a question. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, we often want God to just walk up and say, boy, you are really something. And, and I sure understand what's happening. And I understand how you're feeling. But God ask him, evaluate what you're doing. Uh, you know, Paul this teaches a lesson about counting the cost of the decisions that we are about to make and see if that is a price that really should or it we're willing to pay. Uh, look into it, and before you say yes or no, find out what God wants, and find out if you are in relationship, in his covering, in his provision, in his plan. And uh, uh, God answered by directing Elijah away from the feeling of despair and fear, and uh, he found him there underneath this tree of pity and uh, kind of uh, drowning in his sorrow and fear. And he 
told him to go to the mountain of God. Uh, one of the dear brothers that I've known uh, through my life is uh, A.N. Trotter, great missionary. And I remember he came to the college where I attended and he spoke and he sang a song that was a African song that I, I don't remember who wrote it, but up to the mount I go, up to the mount I go, when the host of sin gathers round me, up to the mount of prayer I go. In Jesus' name I go. In Jesus' name I go. When the host of sin gathers round me, in Jesus' name I go. Wonderful uh, song because it gives a valid and important message that we're taught in Scripture and is exactly what we should do as people of God and faith in God, especially being a servant of the Lord. We should never lose our connection and the place of the hedge of protection and provision that God gives us when we're in his will. We need to stay in the center of God's will. Uh, God answered, uh, answered by asking a question, and very often God does that even for us. Uh, he will ask us to focus, ask us to consider where we're at, what we're doing, and what's about to happen, and then make a decision. Uh, I know that it's good to see how Elijah responded to this question, but God always knew where he was and where Elijah was, but I think in the haste and in the emotion of what was happening to Elijah, what he had just heard and what he'd just been through, in the haste and running off, Elijah didn't realize probably that he had left God. He'd left his servant. And those are things that we need to remember. God has given us word. He's given us faith. He's given us uh, the Holy Spirit. And we should not abandon those gifts that God gives us to protect us and sustain us, guide us, direct us, and empower us. Um, uh, and he said, verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord. This is uh, two times repeated to God when he asked uh, Elijah what he's doing. And he said, I'm the only one left. So it, it shows us inside Elijah felt like he was isolated and alone. No one else really understood what he was going through. And he was utterly felt defeated and discouraged and had no hope, was not walking in faith, was not walking in obedience. He was running from the circumstance. And God, we need to remember, is with us in our circumstances. So if we run from that, we're, we're running from God. If we're running from the people that have been there with us, we're running from what God has provided. If we don't take time to get in his word and pray and allow the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and then empower us and embolden us to get up and do what needs to be done, we're going to be in the same situation as Elijah was. So often in times like this, we become diswrought, disoriented, confused, and discouraged and feel defeated. Uh, there's a danger when we use infinity statements like uh, everyone. Uh, he used the one, I'm the only one, and everyone else has bowed and given in. They're all after me. Uh, always, every time, no one. Those are feelings that come out of our carnal nature and who we were before God came in. Because if we really understand the word of God and understand what happened at salvation and understand the commit covenant promise of the Lord that I will never leave you. I will be with you always and I will never fail you. I will never fail one of my promises. Uh, if Elijah would have just stopped and in his exhaustion said, Lord, I need your help. I need you to carry me during this time. I need you to refresh me. I need you, Lord, to put up a good hedge of protection and defeat my enemies. And yet in the moment of everything that seemed to be falling apart, he runs from the Lord. Uh, verse 11 and 12, he said, go forth and stand upon the mount of the Lord. 
stand before God on the holy mountain. And God came and visited him there. Uh, verse 13 and 14, uh, question. Have you learned, not only from this passage, but have you learned from your walk with God that you need the Lord? Have you learned that he is faithful? Have you learned that he knows the end from the beginning and what's happening in the middle? That he's right there with you in the midst of the circumstance. He's not going to leave you. And it's so important that we keep our faith focus upon the Lord, not upon how we feel, not upon what's happening, and surely not upon what other people say. That's going to take you down every time. You need to depend upon the Holy Spirit, God's Word, and those that He's put in your life to be a covering and a strength and a resource in the time of trouble. Um, Verse 13 and 14, Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the e entering into the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here? And he said, Again, I've been very zealous for the Lord and there's no one around and, and this is what's happening and everybody's out to kill me. Uh, God asked the same question to you and I as he did to Elijah twice. And maybe we need to make an evaluation. What are you doing? Uh, where are you at in your walk with God? Where's God at? Uh, have you left him somewhere that he's still waiting for you to come back because he has something that he wants to teach you, something he wants to use you to do? Uh, have you uh, never stopped and surrendered your will and said yes to the Lord? Uh, I say, yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. Have you done that? And what are you doing about your relationship and the call of God in your life? Another lesson we find in verse 15 through 18, God has still not answered Elijah's concerns. God just said, uh, first, eat and sleep. And then he said, go to the mountain and uh, wait. And... Uh, he said, I, I want to tell you something that you, you don't know. There are, what do you say, verse 18, 7,000 in Israel whose knees have never bowed to veil and never kissed uh, his doctrine or dogma, what the people believe there. They hadn't given in or bought into that. They were still people of God. Uh, God reminds Elijah, and through that reminds us today, you're not alone. I know where you're at. I know why you're here. I want you to look at what's happening. And I want you to understand what you need to do. And he gave him direction. And uh, the lesson for us today is, number one, we're never alone. Number two, that uh, God is in charge of everything. And nothing passes through into our lives or touches us that God's not aware of. And he's promised to keep us in all those situations. Uh, God's watching out for you. And he knows the details, not only of how you're feeling, but why you're feeling that way. Sometimes we don't even know that. But God loves you today and he cares. He has a plan for your life. And he wants you to stop, refresh yourself, uh, nourish yourself and rest, and then allow him to give you discernment, wisdom, understanding, and direction. Something important to remember is that, number one, God knows who you are and where you are. He knows your name, he knows your circumstance, and he knows what's going to be happening, and he wants you to turn to him. Uh, God knows the troubles that we're carrying, and he knows our strength level. He knows that we are spent when we get to that place, and he will not put more on us than we're able to bear but wherewith he would make a way of escape. Uh, God knows the trouble that surrounds us from family, friends, enemies, Satan, demon powers, life itself. Our own body can be our enemy, especially as we age. And we do not have the resilience and the strength that we've always enjoyed. But in those times, we remember that God is everything we will ever need and more. He 
is the one who compensates for our lack. And he gives us not only what we need, but more than we need. And he gives us fellowship. There's many times that we ask of God and he doesn't seem to answer because we're looking for a different answer. But God always answers. And sometimes he's waiting for us to answer the first question. What are you doing? What are you doing? Can you answer that today? In the middle of what's going on, what are you doing? And where are you in connection with God? Where are you in obedience and faith? And where are you in surrendered will and humility? Uh, we need to trust the Lord. And we need to trust his grace. We need to trust his promises, his word. We need to trust the Holy Spirit. And when God does bless us with godly people, we need to put our confidence and trust in their counsel and in their prayers and allow them to partner with us to go forward and to be victorious again. There's an old song I want to share with you. If you know it, sing it with me today. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard that he loves you and that he will be with you till the end? And then he says, the song says, who knows your disappointments? Probably no one but you and the Lord. Who understands your heartache? When I have heartache, I don't, I don't comprehend or understand the fullness of why. I just know how horrible I feel and how empty I feel. But God does. He understands. And then it says, who dries the tears from your eyes? That's the Lord, the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you today, don't run from circumstances that are overwhelming. Don't fear when things and people come against you. You feel like the attacks are mind, body, soul, and spirit, and you're down for the count. At any moment, it's going to be over. In those times, call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, bring me through the Holy Spirit into your presence. Refresh my spirit and my mind and my heart, my soul and my body. Cause me, Lord, to walk in your strength, in your blessing and provision, and bring me to the place you desire me to be, and then give him the glory and the honor. In times of difficulty, you need to remember to nourish yourself so your body has the nutrients it's need. You also need to remember to get some rest. If you go too far, your body will quit on you. Your mind won't be thinking clear and your emotions will not be stable. So I encourage you to get some good rest, eat some nourishing food, and then spend some time on the mountain of the Lord. May God richly bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your week.